Hello, welcome to Illinois Stories. I'm Mark McDonald in Springfield, where the nation's first veteran service organization was formed shortly after the Civil War. The Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Museum commemorates the Grand Army of the Republic and the Women's Relief Corps. If you like Civil War memorabilia, this is a can't miss. Well, Mary Phelps, as you walk in this museum, the first thing you see is this huge Bible on this podium. Right. So I'm, I'm just going to bet that this is significant. <laughs> it's very significant. It's a Bible that's always in the center of the room. Not necessarily this one, but a Bible is mm -hmm. always in the center of the room, and it's opened by the chaplain, and we have prayer, and then we have our meeting. Mm -hmm. Now, th this, a lot of people may not be familiar with what the Grand Army of the Republic is. It was the first, really, service relief organization made up of servicemen from the Union Army in the Civil Correct. War. And like, say, the American Legion members, for instance, mm -hmm. these veterans Correct. joined, uh, they became members, and it was a large nationwide organization, was it not? Yes, it was. It was started on April the 6th, 1866, here in Springfield, but the first post was Decatur, and the largest post was was uh, B.F. Stevenson, and that's called Stevenson Post Number 30. Mm -hmm. And that was in Springfield? Yes. Uh -huh. And this podium is very important because it has right in it G-A-R. And that's what they used. And they had smaller mm -hmm. ones in front of each of the officers. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the chief, whatever his title was. Commander. Commander, okay. Would, would stand at this podium. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, the minister would read from the Bible. A the prayer chaplain. from the chaplain, the chaplain. From the Bible, okay. Yes. And then the meeting would begin. Yes. Okay. Well, the commander would open it from his station, which would be at the head of the mm -hmm. room. And then they would ask the chaplain to come out. And then after the chaplain did their part and they had prayer, then the patriotic instructor came out and they had pledge allegiance to the oh, flag okay. every meeting. Okay. Now that we're going to learn more about the GAR as this, as this program okay. goes on. What this museum is, is a tribute to the GAR yes. and to the Women's Relief Corps. Yes, it's a memorial to them. That. But it's full, chock full of Civil War items, memorabilia, and everything from that era. And it's fascinating. Yes. We're going to take a look through all that stuff. Okay. First, we're going to learn more about the GAR, okay? Okay. Let's go this way and take a look at some of the, uh, some of the furniture that they used okay. during those meetings. And also, you've got some great photographs of some of the original uh, folks who were involved here. Okay. Now, this is where the commander, this was the commander's seat. This is what this would be in front of the room, and the commander would sit at this, and that's why it has a significant as a GAR mm -hmm, in it because mm -hmm. he was the main person for your organization. Mm -hmm. And and this furniture is all from from that yes. era, from those meetings. Yes. There, that that batch of medals on the wall there, um, they were all th those were all given. They weren't all given by that soldier, were they? Not necessarily. No. Okay. They're a collection. They're a collection from throughout the years, huh? Yes. I see. And the run one right in the center says Illinois, so that's important to us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right below the picture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can see it. Okay. Now, this who who are these gentlemen here? Let's this take was the, the last the top one there first. That's the last one. The one that's in color. The the fellow sitting in the chair there. He's He's the last Theodore Penland. He was one of the last ones when they still had the meetings. And then these are just pictures from different times. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now these are all Civil War veterans. Yes. And of course, we're going to learn that the last Civil War veteran at some point had to pass away, the last right. member. Right, exactly. And uh, so then the GAR ended. Ended in 1949. I see, okay. Okay, but the history of the GAR lives on here. Yes, and we keep it going because yeah. we're the Women's Relief Corps. And we're their auxiliary, so we have to keep it alive. Yeah. <laughs> and you're a past president. A national I'm, I'm past a past president. department president and mm -hmm. 10 times or 11 times, and I'm a past national president two years. Mm -hmm. Right. And the caretaker of this museum. Exactly. <laughs> you mow the grass, you shovel the snow, <laughs> you, you clean Well, oh, not a whole lot of snow. The neighbors pretty much do that, but I do the grass most yeah. of the time. Okay. These right here are all the journals yeah. from the all their meetings that they had. Every encampment has a journal in there. Mm-hmm. Some bigger than others, and some pretty dilapidated, as you can see with these, but mm -hmm. they were way back in the years. Mm -hmm. 
Now, Mary, across from the GAR room, you've got the Women's Relief Corps room. Right. This goes through the, like all of the past presidents from the national organization, and it goes way back because I'm looking at uh, one of the original journals here of the of the first uh, president of the Women's Relief Corps, and this is from 84 and 85. I'm going to open and show her picture. This is Florence Barker. She was the first president, and it's it's really nice because here you've got her, you've got her, the original charter and her badge, which mm -hmm. is really really something. Why don't you show those to us if you would? This is her badge mm -hmm. from the na as being national president, and this is the actual charter for the Women's Relief Corps. The charter uh, actually calls this organization into, uh, uh, um, forms this organization from in 1883. You can see the date there at the bottom. Really, something that's that's a that's a priceless thing to have, isn't mm -hmm. it? Now, the Women's Relief Corps. What was what was its purpose? We were formed in 1883, and the first convention, like you said, was 84. And we were to help all veterans of the Civil War then. Now, as there's no more Civil War veterans, now we help all veterans of all wars and help give scholarships and work at VA hospitals and things like that. Mm -hmm. So you're still a veterans we're organization. We're still a veterans organization. Mm -hmm. Harold Wright, how long have you been volunteering at this museum? 25 years. 25 years, you've probably been asked just about every question there is, huh? Well, quite a, quite a few, yes, <laughs> yes, for sure, yeah, yeah. You must love this stuff. And I have a lot of answers, too, <laughs> to the questions, yeah. Are they always the same answer, or do you mix it up a little bit? <laughs> I, I add to it and take away sometimes. I sometimes make, a, make it brief, and sometimes I elongate it, too. D yeah. Depends on how much time those people have when they're in. Yes, here. yes. Hey, you know, when I asked you earlier, I said, if, if I ask you to pick out something in this museum that is that can't miss. You guided me over here mm -hmm. to this flag. Yes. What is the significance of this flag that's in this frame? Well, uh, that flag is a national treasure. When, when John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln in Ford's Theater, the president was in the presidential box on the balcony, mm -hmm. and the balcony has a railing around it, and when Booth shot Lincoln, he jumped over the railing out onto the stage and when he jumped over the railing, he caught his foot and it turned his leg sideways. Mm -hmm. And when he landed on the stage, it broke his ankle. Well, Booth had a man standing at the back door holding his saddled horse. Mm -hmm. This is all planned out. Yeah. And Booth had on his spurs, and his spur was what caught in the flag. And we're seeing right here, we're seeing this torn area. Yes. is where he got his, his foot yeah, caught in the flag. It, yes. And were it not for that, he wouldn't have broken his foot, and he may have made a clean getaway. And, and it changed uh, history, for it, sure. It sure did. Sure did. I, I want to show another photograph, too, um, right below here. This is uh, the restored Forge Theater now, and you can see where the, where the seats are and the presidential box over here. This would have been the area of the flag where he caught his, his foot, his spurred, his spurred leg, and uh, led to his broken foot when he leapt onto the stage. That is a real find. Now, the, 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 the logical question is, how does a flag like this get in the hands of this museum? Well, this George Preston Clark, the man that got the flag, was the custodian of a building right down the street from Ford's Theater. Mm -hmm. And this Clark and the custodian at Ford's were good friends. And when the assassination happened, the man at Ford's went down to Clark's building and told him, if you want to get a souvenir, come get it while the getting's good. Mm -hmm. So Clark came up immediately, and he chose that flag as his souvenir. Well, this George Preston Clark, the way we got it, his wife was a member of this Woman's Relief Corps that uh -huh. have this museum. And now, when George Preston Clark took the flag, he put that frame around it, and he took it all up and down the east coast of the United States and took the flag with him as a drawing card mm -hmm. to raise money for the widows and orphans of the Civil War, mm -hmm. which he did for years and years. Well, then the Clark family used that as a, a gathering thing when they had their family reunions every year. And then eventually after, well, until 1974, they had it at their family reunions. Mm -hmm. Well, then they decided it should be in a museum and since she was a member of this museum, they gave the flag wow. to us. And that's, how, that's how we got the flag. It's a national treasure, yes. Well, Jackie Wright, you're a former teacher. 
Yeah. And you're a volunteer here. You've been involved with Women's Relief Corps for some time. Yes. And I've been told that whenever anybody has a question about history, that you're the you're the one that loves to do the research to find out. Yes, I'm interested <laughs> in history. <laughs> Well, you're the right person for this then, because I'm going to ask you some questions, all right? Okay. okay. Well, we, we're real proud of the museum. You should be. You should be. This um, is really kind of a, an unknown gem, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, when you walk in here, you get the feeling that, wow, you know, and well, why didn't I did. hear about this before? Mm -hmm. I, I want to show a photograph, okay? okay. Uh, because we're talking about this museum and where this museum sits. Okay. Um, there used to be a, a home here which served as the museum before this was built. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at, at this structure right here. Yeah. This is at 7th and Cook, isn't it? 629 South 7th. Mm -hmm. And uh, before this was built in 1963, that home served as the museum. And I guess also, was that also the national, national headquarters. headquarters of the Women's Relief Corps? Yes, Corps. and the National Treasurer used to live here. Mm -hmm. Vivian, uh, Vivian Gertz is yeah. here. And that, uh, ran, ran out of room. That house wasn't big enough. Yeah. You got well, enough room now? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, one of the things that... Uh, this was exchanged for the property, the Corno House, uh -huh. that's opposite of the Lincoln home, yeah. and I was given to the uh, Junior League for, and then they spent eight thousand dollars to move the yeah. house next door to the Lincoln home, mm -hmm. and then um, this was the formation of the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. I see, but. Um, they objected to the building being built opposite of the Lincoln home. Yeah. They thought it wasn't appropriate, mm -hmm. but they already had their groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. So then they had to come back to this site and demolish I their see. house. Okay, well that's kind of a shame, but in a way, mm -hmm. this is really a good location for this. Yes, and, um, and we were, the one thing about this building, it was built with funds that it, they were not in debt. The Women's Relief Corps paid mm -hmm. for this building entirely. Yeah. Let, let's let's look up on the wall here, just behind you. You were telling me about Andersonville Prison earlier. Yes. And this is a very old uh, picture of a sketch, I think, of, of the prison. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason you're so proud of this item is because the Women's, Women's Relief Corps had a lot to do with going into Andersonville yeah. after the Civil War. Yes, the veterans of Georgia gave the Andersonville to the Women's Relief Corps mm -hmm. to restore. Jackie, most people don't know that at Andersonville there were sort of mass graves, just trench graves, yes. that the Union prisoners who passed away there, yes. their bodies were just buried in trenches. And, and your group um, actually in years after that went in and re dug those up and re-identified yes. and f gave them a proper burial here at Andersonville, yes. which is a, a huge task, isn't it? They're very close together, those uh, tombstones, and some military um, graveyards that uh, they're far apart, but here they're so close yeah. together. Yeah, but I mean, because the fact it that represents you, how many that were dead, I mean, yeah. were killed My there. My goodness, but the fact that you that you went in there and and, uh, and identified, your group went in there, identified uh, yes, the, those those uh, veterans and then uh, and gave them a proper burial is just an enormous... Well, we still honor Clara Barton and Elizabeth Turner for their work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they built a pavilion there to take care of different veterans groups too. Mm -hmm. Wow. Harold, this museum has a wonderful collection of Confederate money, Confederate cash. And uh, it came from the Treasury Department, I guess after the war they ended up with it and didn't really they just held it until uh, some of it went to museums. Yes. And you're one of the lucky yes. beneficiaries of yes. it. Huh? Yes. Now, we're looking at some of these bills have holes. You can see these regular holes in them, and, and others have different, uh, different cutouts. What's that about? Well, Confederate money wasn't cash. They were promissory notes. They were interest-bearing, and they had an expiration date and they were redeemable in silver or gold at the Treasury Department in Richmond. Mm -hmm. The reason why you see these different cutouts is when the money was redeemed, it was canceled. Those are cancellation marks, and then they were taken out of circulation. Mm -hmm. But to a collector, that doesn't add or detract 
from the value of the money, it still maintains its same value, mm -hmm. whether it's been canceled yeah. or not canceled. To, to, to show what you're talking about here, for instance, up here, you say this is completely different way of canceling this than the round ones we saw. Well, each, each clerk, when he redeemed mm -hmm. the money, every clerk had his own identification mark. That's so they could tell yeah. who canceled who yeah. canceled what. Yeah. I don't know whether they kept a record of how many they canceled, but anyhow, that's... Yeah. That's the, what the different... Yeah. And, and some of them aren't canceled. Some of them just never got, uh, got redeemed. Well, they probably, they, they'd probably lost their value and they couldn't redeem them. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason, the reason Confederate money lost its value was England and France, where they bought their supplies, wouldn't take paper money. They would only take silver or gold. Mm -hmm. And that's, the reason, that's what drained their treasury out where they couldn't redeem the money. Okay, now you, you told me something interesting too about these about this money. They didn't have, at the start of the war, they didn't have printing presses in the South. No, the, the South, at the beginning of the war, the South didn't have any printing presses and they had to send to New York City to the New York Banknote Company and they bought their Confederate money from the Confederate, or from the National Bank in New York City. That would City. have seemed like treason to some people. Well, it pro <laughs> probably, probably was close to it, but where there was a dollar involved, you're going to get, oh, you're man. going to get takers, oh, you know. Yeah, okay, so I imagine it was legal. Uh, it may be unethical, but it was legal, huh? Well, but another thing about Confederate money was when they, when they printed the money, they left the lines for the Secretary and Treasury to sign those bills, when they printed the bills, they printed everything but the but the signatures, sure. and they had to be hand signed. You're kidding! For Thousands hand, of bills yes, had to be hand signed. Yes, so they had they had to hire mm -hmm. clerks to sign their names. <laughs> and the thing about the Confederate money, it is always signed. The real Confederate money is always signed in two places in brown ink, and the significance of the brown ink was it was made from walnut hulls, which holds up its color it doesn't it doesn't fade out very well and that's the way you can tell real confederate money from confederate uh, from counterfeit money is the counterfeit money is signed in black ink okay so if you have if your bills are signed in black ink they're bogus if they're signed in right. brown ink then they are real real the money. real deal real hey money. let's go over here into this other cabinet for a moment i want you to show me something Now, I didn't, another item about the Civil War I had no idea about was the prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And before there were any prisons, prisoners of war, uh, prisons built, they would exchange prisoners, yes. wouldn't they? Yes, yes. And, and we're looking at an 1863, in fact, this is from Vicksburg, Mississippi in June of 1863. This is a prisoner exchange form. Yes, yes. Wow, <clears throat> the original deal. Yes, and it's... As far as I know, I, I have never seen or heard of any other one than the one that we have. They're, they are very scarce. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and it's signed, it, it gets signed by the prisoner himself, and he, yeah. he, he promises yes, not, he, not to take up arms, doesn't he? He, he will be absolutely neutral. He will have to, nothing to do with military whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely nothing. Well, Mary, at Gettysburg, there is a monument that the Women's Relief Corps I guess goes out to observe every year, huh? Correct. And and this man is important because, well, for several reasons, but he was the last surviving member, is that right, of the GAR? Correct. Who is this fellow? It's Albert Wilson. He died in uh, 1956 at 109. Mm -hmm. So every year on Remembrance Day, lots of people go out there, including the Women's Relief Corps and all the Allied Orders, and they have a big parade and a ceremony, and we each present a wreath in honor of our organization. Mm -hmm. I'll bet that was a very sad day because the grand, particularly yourselves, who are very involved in this historically, to see the, the entire veterans service group come to an end mm -hmm. must have been sad. Correct. Now we just have like the sons and the daughters and on down because that generation's gone. Mm -hmm. Well, Jackie, one of the famous artists of the Civil War period was Edwin Forbes. Yes. Uh, a, a member of the publishing uh, family, mm -hmm. I guess, and, and there's a book by him here called Civil War Etchings. Um, he traveled with the Union soldiers during the war, made sketches, and interestingly, this museum has an entire set yes, of his... Yes, one of 14 existing sets. Wow. And, and uh, 
you like them, or actually reenactors like them, because they can really get a sense of detail here, can't they? Yes. They're, de they're in depth. They have so many detail, and these are called copper etchings rather than the uh, iron or steel etchings. Mm -hmm. And we do have people that like to come and take pictures of these. Mm -hmm. But you can tell the details of the tents, the clothing. We're looking at the one now called A Halt in the Line of Battle, and, and this is uh, after uh, the enemy was chased away off a battlefield, and some of the bodies are still are still there, and they're uh, they're lining up uh, and before they advance. It's uh, and you could see why a reenactor would want the detail of the uniforms and the weapons. Now we're looking at uh, the rear of the column. These are the guys uh, bringing up the the rear as they're marching across the countryside. They really are wonderful. And uh, oh, this this even when you're not fighting. Bet a war war is hell because look at look they get stuck in the mud and in the thunderstorm there dragging mm -hmm. dragging their way across. And to here with the campgrounds. A flank a flank march across country during a thunderstorm, which is the top one. This is fall in for soup company mess. Mm -hmm. I bet that was bad food, don't you think? Well, it, sometimes it. Leavings from things and coffee grounds, or mm -hmm. they use corn a lot too to take the place of coffee. Mm -hmm. Anything, anything edible, and sometimes probably yes. <laughs> wasn't even mm -hmm. edible. Well, when there was a death, your uh, flour and salt and sugar and coffee and tea went back with the body. You took it back to the mm -hmm. hometown, but mm -hmm. by an escort. Mm -hmm. And for this area, it would be down the Mississippi and up. Well, Harold, the museum's fortunate to have another complete set. And, uh, and this complete set of badges is, uh, wh what does this come from? Well, this Roger Heupel, who lives in Michigan, was the maker of that. And the set, he has a complete set, and we have a complete set. And that's the only two complete sets that are known to exist. And, and what are they from? What are these badges well, from? Those are, that is a complete set of the National Convention badges of the Grand Army of the Republic, mm -hmm. and they were made from when Robert Todd Lincoln was Secretary of War under Garfield. Mm -hmm. And in and, and that position, Gar, uh, Robert Todd Lincoln was able to procure cannons from the various arsenals, Confederate cannon, captured Confederate cannons, yeah. which he gave to the GAR, and they melted those cannons down and made their badges from melted down that confederate right? Well, that's cannons. ironic, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yes, yes, it is. A good use for it. Yeah. Now, this is the Robert Todd Lincoln. This would have been the son of Abraham Lincoln. The, the, the only one that lived to maturity, yes. Mm -hmm. Robert Todd Lincoln, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And he was Secretary of War under, under Garfield. Garfield. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. I, don't th I don't guess I knew that. Yeah. Now, we're, you also have a wonderful collection of flags here. Yes. We saw the one that John Wilkes Booth tripped on mm -hmm. and causing him to break his leg at Ford's yes. Theater. Yes. But back behind you is another wonderful example, and this is, this is really, I think, exceptional because this would have been the 1861 Civil War flag. Yes, Eight, that's uh, 80th Indiana Infantry Department Division, mm -hmm. yeah. That was their battle flag, and they carried that from the very beginning to the total end of the Civil War. They were involved in the whole Civil War. That saw the that, whole war, that, that flag. That poor flag saw the whole it war. It looks like it's it almost yes. tattered. And, yes. But it's, it's a great honor to have it here. Now, that, that says 34 stars. Yes. That's how many stars there were in the American flag when the Civil War started. Uh -huh. And there were 35 stars and 36 stars during the Civil War. Because states were admitted yes, to the during, Union during, during, during the Civil that. War. Oh, I yes. see. Okay. And that was, yeah. yeah. That, but, that poor old flag is a treasure. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Harold, in camp, a Civil War soldier would, after, after fighting or slugging through mud all day long, they, they'd take a break at night, I guess, around the fire, but they didn't really get a break, did they? Because they had to carry these instruments with them. What did they, what did they use these for? Well, when the government couldn't make bullets fast enough to supply the army, so they had to issue the soldiers a melting pot Mm -hmm. and chunks of lead and bullet molds. Mm -hmm. And then when the soldiers had their fire going for whatever meal they were fixing, they would have to melt their lead in their melting pot and cast their own bullets. Wow. 
Well, that's amazing. So, so if you expect to fight the next day, you'd better have, yeah, you'd better it, have some bullets yes, made up yes, early. And that, and that's what the whole idea yeah. was. I'll be darned. And, and, and that hunk of lead, now that, that very well may have come from, uh, from Illinois. From, maybe. from Galena. Uh -huh. Now, Galena is synonymous with lead. Lead mm -hmm. and Galena are interchangeable, that same, same word. And that came from Galena, Illinois. But mm -hmm. the thing about the Galena lead was there weren't any impurities in it. It was pure, and they didn't have to uh -huh. filter out the odds and ends yeah. out of the lead. They could just melt the chunks of lead and pour their bullets right out of their bullet hole. Yeah. Galena, U.S. Grant's home. Home. Yeah. Grant, Grant lived in let's, Galena. Let's go back down there for a minute. Just behind that little pot, now there's a canteen. Mm -hmm. And I think you can tell by looking at that canteen that th this soldier might have seen some action. Yes, <laughs> yes. What, do you think he tried to repair that thing or what? Yes, I, I don't... I don't know what caused the holes or how many holes there are in it, but yes, that is a, wow. a many time repaired canteen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I expect it stopped bullets. It may have uh, saved his life a few times. Yes, it, it probably, it very well could have. This is a really good example of what they were issued for uh, for, for, for mess. A, a knife and a fork. I, I noticed there's no spoon there. Yes, they, most of them didn't have spoons. That's the reason. Mm -hmm. It was kind of hard to eat peas with the army army equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and you just drink your soup, I guess. It's so thin, you wouldn't need to pick anything up and just drink that's it. That's the way it seems to me, yeah. yeah. There were two styles of canteens, and we saw the one that's been repaired. It was called we, a smooth side, yeah. and the other one's called a bullseye. Mm -hmm. As it's, you can see why it's called a bullseye. Yeah, it's it's kind of like corrugated in a round, in a round way. Well, I don't know what a target. That, it's a target with a bullseye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. The Grand Army of the Republic Memorial Museum is open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. And it's free. Donations are accepted. With another Illinois story in Springfield, I'm Mark McDonald. Thanks for watching. A DVD copy of this episode of Illinois Stories, send 1995 to Network Knowledge, P.O. Box 6248, Springfield, Illinois 62708. Be sure to include the program name, broadcast date, and topic. You may also order with your credit card by calling 800-232-3605 or by using our secure server by going online to networkknowledge.tv.